Good morning, Jubilites, or evening, Jubilites, sorry. <laughs> Not a good start. Let me, let me calm my own nerves first by drinking. Water, yes. Though, who knows, maybe. <laughs> but also, I'm going to send a few shout-outs this evening. Um, you know, they say preaching, no matter how long you've been preaching, you always, just before you announced up, on the surface, you look really calm, like a duck paddling. But underneath, you just like, Pfft. and just now I felt that. So let me send a few shout outs. I saw Clay, Clay Morrison. I didn't even know you play guitar, man. Where you at? Uh, that's Clay Morrison. Um, shout out to Clay Morrison. <laughs> um, yeah, at, at, at some stage in uh, Cape Town, uh, Claire Morrison was one, is, was one of the people in my digs, so that's how I know her, uh, through many, many interactions. Um, there are people here who have to be here for the second time, so the team at the back, I'm not sure if I should say yay or are you guys are just, you know, you've got to be here. But anyway, it's good to, to see you again. You've got to do the work that you've got to do. Um, but I saw Sja, Sja is here for the second time. After having heard what I have to say, she's coming to hear it again. So, yeah, she said um, it should earn her a one-way ticket first class into the celestial city. Um, and I see Jeff. Um, it's good to see Jeff and his wife. And there's about, maybe not the only people I know, but I'm going to stop there. Last, Jordan at the back. If I, if, if I know you and I didn't greet you, come and talk to me afterwards. So, so then I can greet you personally. All right, the nerves out of the way. Let me pray. I know Darren prayed for me, but let me pray for myself, and then we'll get started. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your words that give life. We pray that this evening they may indeed do that for us. As we hear you speak, let my words, my thoughts disappear. Let only what you have to say remain. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. I've entitled my talk as part of the series here, Jubilee, uh, Peace, Where Art Thou? Um, last week, if you were here, um, you would have heard from Siviwe uh, on hope. Next week, if you are here, you will hear, not in the evening, obviously, in the morning, um, you will hear from Wes on uh, Luke 1, 49 to 55. And then on Christmas Day, you will hear from Le Lex on love. So I get to speak to you about peace. The first two times I made this uh, statement, it was lost in the crowd. There was a fellow at the back there in the morning who knew the answer in the club. Uh, Community, people are like, huh, what are you talking about? I'm hoping it will be more uh, winsome here. So tell me if you know where this comes from. I see a suit of armor around the world. Peace in our time. Imagine that. Anybody knows where that's from? You almost said Tom Cruise, didn't you? <laughs> okay, yes, that's right. Avengers. Now, for those of you who don't know what Avengers is, I wouldn't really blame you because who honestly is interested watching a bunch of adults wearing underwears over their clothes demonstrating supernatural human powers? I am. Um, so if you want to know what it's all about, you should join me. I think it's... It's pretty fantastic storylines. Anyway, the line is from the movie Age of Ultron. I'm not going to spoil too much from the movie. You should watch it. Um, there's a, a scene in the movie where Iron Man, a.k.a. Tony Stark, is speaking with Bruce Banner, a.k.a. The Hulk. And this is at the back of the first movie that was all about alien invasion. And so Tony Stark is saying to Bruce Banner, imagine that we had a suit of armor everywhere in the world. We wouldn't need to fight battles. There will be peace in our times. Watch the movie and see if indeed he is correct. 
But I suspect that what Tony Stark and Bruce Banner are talking about, though fictitious, part of it is true in how we think about peace. I think you and I have an element of thinking that peace primarily resides in the absence of war, in the absence of suffering, in the absence of evil. And I don't think we are necessarily wrong in thinking that that's where peace resides, but I think, I'm convinced that if that's all we think peace is, absence of bad things in the world, then we are far too easily pleased. C.S. Lewis has written a book where he says, people are far too easily pleased. They are far more content to be playing with mud pies when there is an offer of a holiday at sea. I think when we define peace in our time simply as the absence of things that are wrong in the world, we miss the mark. And I'm hoping that this evening, as I take you through the first two chapters of the Gospel of Luke, you'll be able to have a bigger, better, deeper definition of peace in our time. So, what is your definition of peace? Before I get anywhere, let me just give you spoiler alert. Nobody likes people who spoil things for others. But in the Christian circles, it's the only time it's acceptable to spoil the ending. And the ending, the beginning, the middle of anything and everything that I'm gonna say is Jesus. So there you go. Whatever I'm gonna be saying, all finds its meaning in Jesus. But before we get there, I think I need to ask two crucial questions that I'm hoping as we go through the Gospel of Luke, as we think about the concept of peace, will help us. The two questions are, what do you make of Mary's child? In 14 days, you and I will wake up, some of us will go under the chimney, look for gifts, some of us will get that cookie and milk, and whatever it is you do, but on on Christmas Day, we're gonna be celebrating the birth of Jesus. What does that mean to you? Who is Jesus really to you? To your thoughts, to how you live your life, to how you spend your days? That's the first question I want us to consider. What do you make of Mary's child? And the second thing is, why should you believe anything about Jesus from this book? What makes this book credible? What makes this book worthy of laying down your life for? Because many have done so. Many have died in defense of this book. I'll tell you the reasons, so let's start with the second question, why should we believe anything found in this book? Particularly in the Gospel of Luke. Luke was a doctor. He writes these uh, 24 chapters about Jesus. But why should we believe what he has to say? I'm gonna read from chapter one, the first four verses of the Gospel of Luke. If you have your Bibles, it's on a screen, it's on a tattered Bible, it's in your mind. If you've memorized it, let's read. And I'm reading from the ESV, verse one. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us. It seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. Here are three reasons why everything that I'm about to say is worthy of your trust. Luke, who writes this book, has done a carefully investigated work. It's not just hearsay. He's worked hard on the evidence of the material to present what we will hear when we read the story about Jesus. Number two, what Luke writes to us is an orderly account of events. 
these things happened. And the reason why we know these things happened, number three, is because they are verifiable eyewitnesses. If you were alive in the time of Jesus, you could go to people and ask them about what Luke wrote. They could tell you because they were there. You can't review, refute lived experiences, eyewitness testimony. And so whatever I'm about to say about Jesus, whatever I'm about to say about the definition of peace from the Bible is worth of your trust because of these three factors. Off the bat, Luke gives us seven songs, seven eyewitnesses of people testifying about Jesus. Time won't allow me to go into great detail in any one of these, so I will do some cherry picking of these, but let me just outline them for you, the places in the first two chapters of the Gospel of Luke where you can see, hear people who were there. There's the Elizabeth song in in chapter 125 and 41 to 45. Then there's Gabriel in chapter 128 to 38. Then there's Mary in chapter 146 to 55. Wes will look at this in greater detail as he contrasts some of the songs next week. Then there is Zechariah in chapter 167 to 79. Then there is the shepherds and the heavenly host in chapter 2, 8 to 20. Simeon in chapter 2, 25 to 35. And then the prophetess Anna in chapter 2, 36 to 38. If you are a follower of Jesus and you read your Bible daily, regularly, maybe not daily, but regularly, I would encourage you to go through those, maybe pick one for every day of the week. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, perfect. Pick one for every day of the week, read it, reflect it, engage with it, think what it's saying, ask yourself questions. Is it true for you? You will get a bigger, better, more meaningful understanding of who Jesus is. So let me do some cherry picking of these songs, of these eyewitnesses to help expand and unpack our meaning of peace in our time. In the Gospel of Luke, you will read of the word peace only three times in these first two chapters. You will read of the word peace in chapter one, verse 79, as part of Zechariah's song, to give light to those who sit in the darkness and in the shadow of death, to give, to guide our feet into the way of peace. You will read the word again in chapter two, verse 14, as the song of the heavenly host once they've heard about the birth of this child. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. And finally, you will read the word peace in chapter two, verse 29. Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace. But just because you're reading the word peace three times in two chapters doesn't mean it doesn't exist everywhere else in the two chapters. The rest of the songs speak of this concept in action. They speak about peace being pursued. They speak about what peace looks like. And it's certainly not simply the absence of war. These three explicit descriptions help us understand two particular truths about biblical peace. And the rest of our talk is gonna be taken in trying to unpack those two understandings of biblical peace. And the first thing about biblical peace is that it is multifaceted and relational. The second thing about the biblical peace is that it is at its core all to do about Mary's child, the Lord Jesus. The original word for the word peace Looking at the first thing now, the original word about peace in the Old Testament for a people, the Hebrew people, the nation of God uh, that he had chosen to reveal himself to had the word shalom. The word shalom, even when you say it, shalom, is very deep and meaningful. It unpacks with it harmony, wholeness, completeness, prosperity, welfare, tranquility. 
When you closely relate and inspect this word, shalom, you come with the ideas of safety, security, salvation, forgiveness, among other things. This is what peace is tied up with. All these things are relational. These things are multifaceted. They're all true at the same time. So let me show you in the first two chapters by highlighting a few examples where peace is multifaceted and relational. If you still got your Bibles open in whatever format, Luke chapter 1, verse 13. This is after Zechariah turns pale at the sight of the Lord's angel who had come to deliver some pretty big news. We read in verse 13 of chapter 1, but the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. If I was to rewrite this part of the word of the angel in my Sandile simple version, it would have a little bit of a, a beat. Yo, 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 Zach, my man, hush, be at peace. You and God are good. That's relational. I'm not going to go more than that. But I could, but I won't. Basically, what the angel is saying to Zechariah is that you have been heard by God. Relationally, there's peace between you and God, and that is at the heart of what peace is. There's a relationship. There's an understanding. Unfortunately for Zech, he goes mute because he doesn't believe the words of the angel. And then the angel comes again to a young girl named Mary in verse 28 of chapter 1. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. Gabriel even spells it out to Mary, You have found favor with God. Once again, that relational aspect. Mary has peace with God. Mary believes believes this good news of the favor that she has with God. Not based on anything that Mary has done, solely based on the works and the sovereign plan of God. One last cherry picking in the first two chapters to show us this relational, multifaceted dimension of peace is Elizabeth's praise. When she meets Mary now, Elizabeth is the wife of Zechariah. They are very old in age, way past the childbearing age. And yet, when she meets Mary, her cousin, she's already six months pregnant. She doesn't have to come too close. The baby begins to do somersault in a womb, just at the joy of being near the savior of the world. And so she breaks out in praise speaking about the marvelous works that this child, who's making her unborn child, do somersaults in her womb. This piece becomes expanded. It is highlighting the restoration that this child, Mary's child, will bring through the relationships. It is spoken of in terms of John coming before Jesus, will help prepare people to bring them back to the Lord. No wonder John does a backflip, and maybe a pirouette, or is it pirouette? So that is the first thing that I want us to understand and reflect and think about biblical peace. It is multifaceted, it is relationship-based. It has to do with you and God. It has to do with how God sees you, how God bestows his kindness as you inch into Christmas, 14 days away, understand that that is peace, not the absence of war, suffering, and all the evil in the world. You can have this relational peace despite those circumstances, in the midst of those circumstances. The second and final thing about biblical peace is that everything about it has to do with the Lord Jesus Christ. Once again, let me do some cherry picking. 
for the sake of time. Let's look at first the, the angel's words. We're back to Zechariah now about his miracle baby. If you read the story carefully, the story is really not about John. There's a little bit about John. There's a line in the beginning there that asks the question, what child then is this going to be? But if you read it closely and you examine the words that are spoken about John, John is only a footnote into what Jesus will do, will be. And so it's really from start to finish, even when it is about other people, it is about Jesus. The angel says there, or rather Zechariah in response, says that this child will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. There's a second thing about this biblical piece having to do with Jesus. In our world, in our time, history, you go as far back as you can. Anytime a king is ruled, his rule is short-lived. He dies. And usually that peace dies with him, if there is peace at all. It is different, however, when it comes to Jesus, because Jesus' kingdom, Jesus' rule and reign is forever. It has no end. His peace is forevermore. You don't have to worry that another greater, bigger, more powerful, evil baddie will come and take that away. The peace that Jesus bestows is peace forevermore. When you look at Mary's song, famously known as the Magnificat, I love the first song that we sang, because in many ways, it is Luke chapter one from verse 49 to 55. The words are very, very, very similar. Now, it's not called Magnificat because maybe in Mary's time, there were many magnificent cats in the Holy Land. No, it is called Magnificat because it is a Latin phrase meaning my soul magnifies the Lord. When Mary hears the words from the angel about the baby she is to give birth to, her soul magnifies the Lord. She speaks greatly of this king. She unpacks the character and the works of this king. And her words of praise from her soul are like many of the Psalms we read about the salvation that this king will bring. And mind you, he is not even born yet. And yet there's so much worth and privilege and power and significance placed upon him. And then finally, the shepherds and the angelic host, Simeon and Anna, the prophetess, all unpack in words from their souls about Jesus, the child of Mary. They speak about how this moment in history is for the good of all the world. In Matthew, the way that Jesus is foretold, where rather the parents are told you are to name him Jesus because he will deal with his people and their sins. It's all about Jesus, folks. If you want peace in your time, peace in your heart, peace in your life, peace in your relationships, it cannot be found anywhere else except in Jesus. The peace that Jesus gives is to restore ruined relationships, broken relationships, broken people, that is the secret to peace in our time. I have one final thing to say. And I hope that you will allow me to ask two personal questions that as you move towards Christmas, you can ask as often as you are able. The first question I want you to ponder and reflect is, do you have shalom? Do you have peace? Is the Prince of Peace, Jesus, the Lord 
ruling and reigning in your life, in your heart. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not at this point asking, are you living a moralistic life without fault? Because I can answer that for you for free. No, you're not. I'm not, you're not, we're not, period. So I'm not asking about your eth ethics. I'm not asking about your words that are unkind, your thoughts that are foul. I'm not asking ab about any of that. I'm asking if the Prince of Peace rules in your heart. I'm not asking if you know about God, because I suspect that you do. It's not a hard thing to know a lot of things about God, because we've got books that we read, the Bible, we've got other books in the bookshelves, some of them not as helpful as the others, but we all can know something about God. So that's not what I'm asking. I'm asking if you have a relationship with the Prince of Peace. I'm asking if when you stuff up, which you will do, can you go to him in confidence that he will forgive you? In fact, that he has forgiven you. I'm asking if when life is really, really difficult, and it will be, live long enough, you will suffer. But I'm asking if in those days, in those times, in those moments, could you look up and say, I know the Lord is with me and therefore it is well with my soul. That's what I'm asking if I'm asking, do you have shalom? Because Mary's child, the Lord Jesus, came to earth to bring that kind of peace. And then secondly, I want to ask, what is your idea of peace? See, in this world that we live, we associate peace with many things, good things. We associate peace with the security behind our walls, our laser beams, our triple, triple door, trilly doors. We think, yeah, I can go to bed at night feeling secure. Bad guy, you just try it. But that is not peace, because that is not guaranteed. These guys are clever, and each time they figure out ways to break in. Some of us tie peace to relationships. I've got 10,000 likes, I've got nice friends on Facebook, Instagram, I always call it Instagram, but I've got friends, I've got nice relationships. I feel at peace, that's not peace. Friends can betray you. Some of us tie peace with careers. I'm on a good path, I'm gonna accomplish great things. That's not peace. What if you break your leg or hand? What if your mind doesn't function as the, as, as the way it does right now? I've got a member in my church community, one of the greatest minds in the field of water cleansing, uh, I, I don't know the, the proper, proper words, but he was a professor at UCT just over two years ago getting ready to come worship with God's people. He falls down, had a stroke ever since. The greatest mind has traveled the world. People call on him for solutions all over the world. Your health, your wealth is not guaranteed. So if you are tying peace to any of those things that come and go, you are far too easily pleased. I want to encourage us. I want to challenge us. I want to say, 14 days to Christmas, let's have a biblical idea of peace, which is only found in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's not live presumptuously, tying peace to things that are momentary, to things that have a, an expiry date. I'm asking us to know the peace that is from God, peace that is with God, peace that passes all understanding, peace that guides our hearts and leads us to life. 
When we have that idea of peace, we will have peace with one another. And no matter what happens in life, no matter how scary life becomes, it will be well with our souls. Listen to these words from Jesus in John chapter 14, verse 27. Peace I live with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Remember that as you celebrate Christmas 14 days from now. Peace with God, peace from God, peace in your relationships. That is peace in our time. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this moment, for this opportunity, for this time to reflect, to engage, to think of what peace really is about. We pray that you'd help us where we have forsaken the biblical perspective of peace, where we have tied peace to things that are not everlasting. As good as those things are, help us today as we move towards Christmas to have your eyes on what peace is. Relationship with you that sets us free, even in times of great difficulty, to be able to say it is well with our souls. In Jesus' name, amen. Now usually, I don't know about Darren, I don't know about this church community, I uh, don't know how much time we have, but if there are questions, I'm not going anywhere. I hope I can answer some of the questions. If I cannot answer some of the questions, I know Jeff can answer the questions, so you can run to Jeff. But thank you.